first the question uh, of, of the group here. Uh, David showed uh, two pictures, one of the sort of a homestead of the 1920s, and then this big mansion. How many people would rather grow, if you had a choice of where you could grow up, would you rather grow up in a big mansion all alone or in that little homestead house with nine brothers and sisters? Which one? How many want to go for the mansion? The homestead house. Oh, geez, okay. Uh, One of my points was going to be sometimes in these conversations, <laughs> we spend too much t time on material things and not some of the other things. But we'll, we'll adjust. Uh, as I, the introduction said, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and when uh, Claire in invited me to give this talk, I was doing a bit of traveling. I've been to some other countries and doing family business stuff. And it was sort of the, the, the the, to the topic that intrigued me, you know, the next generation entitled. And uh, I was thinking, well, maybe, you know, let me think about that, because, uh, you know, the, the topic. And so I said, well, entitled or entrapped? And I wanted to sort of speak for the next generation. And, and my talk's sort of going to be on that side, because I'm sort of different. I work at a university, and uh, I, I kind of, like David says, if, you, if you're in counseling or you're in addictions or whatever, you deal with a certain segment of the population. I also deal with the next generation, but probably that 5% who's, who's you know, gone to school, been successful, or who are working in family firms and so on. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm talking about that 5%. And sometimes you know, it's, it, it's, it's not so easy in terms of what, what they do. So I'm, I'm sort of the counterpoint to sort of the, sort of the entitlement thing. Because the, the people that I've been privileged to work with, I greatly respect and admire in terms of what they're, what they're setting out to do. And I really believe that the, uh, in terms of our, our uh, productivity of nations and our societal well-being largely depends on that next generation. Heaven knows we can't leave it up to government. Okay. Uh, alone, okay. So, so, so there's a lot riding on the next generation. One of the things too we talk about entitlement is terms of when you go throughout, throughout history, every generation, whether uh, it's a few hundred years or thousands of years, people are always whining about the next generation. And the next generation often comes through and delivers. So you know, you know that, that's sort of a bit of the top, you know, what, what I'll be addressing today. And, and so I had a nice introduction, uh, but in terms of, and I'm, I'm privileged to go, you know, elsewhere in the world. And I was teaching a course at Imperial College in uh, in London last year on, on entrepreneurship and family business. And one of the students in my class said, "Dr. Steyer, you know, I, I, just, I like the material here. I, I've just taken over of a family farm. My, the, this family farm has been in our family for 700 years." And I'm the first female to be, to be running it. And I thought, well, that was sort of neat. But, but my question to her was, you know, how did you do this for 700 years? Do you have cer certain routines and so on and so forth? And the, but one of the things about Western Canada is we have very few fir firms. We have no firms with a history of 700 years or even to go back four or five generations. One of the firms that's speaking a little later, we have that. So I'll make a point in terms of we really don't have those roadmaps in terms of what, what we're doing. And, 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 you know, I'll address that in, in a second. So, uh, you know, uh, a little bit about our, our, our program in terms of, I'm primarily a researcher and, and uh, we have a number of things uh, uh, at, our, at the University of Alberta School of Business. We work jointly with Calgary, the University of Calgary, uh, you know, CAFE, various organizations. And, uh, but we, 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 in my, I sort of came to family business through, you know, people say, how do you know about family business? So, you know, I get nice introductions like this, but I grew up in a farming community. My grandparents were homesteaders. That community is just on the Saskatchewan border, Leader Prairie. If you go 100, about 120 miles straight east of here, you know, it's the same uh, uh, latitude, you know, that's about where I grew up. And people say, how do you learn so much about family business? A lot of what I learned about family business, I knew by the time I was in grade two. Because all of, the, all of my friends, everybody, family farms and so on, next generation, the notions of stewardship uh, to the land, uh, who's going to get the land, the division wanting to grow and all that stuff. So, you, so, you know, you learn sort of a lot, of a lot of values there. And one of the things that strikes me is a, a, few, a couple of years ago, my, my father passed away. He was you know, 92 years old, had a good life. And we were sort of, well, well, another family had sponsored a catering event at, at my, at my uh, brother-in-law's farm. And so out, of, out at the farm, families gathered and so on. I kind of walked around the house to the front of the house with a nice view and I'm sitting on a chair alone. And, my oldest son came up to me, and it's one of those moments where your son wants to, you know, sort of say nice things, and it's one of, the, one of those teachable moments for him or me. <laughs> and he said, you know, Dad, Uncle's got a real nice farm here. 
you know, he grew up, you know, farm and so on. And, on. and I said, yeah. I said, that's right, that's nice. Uncle's got a nice farm. Uncle's done a lot to grow this farm. But what you have to realize, son, is it took 100 years to build this farm. And Uncle's just got it now doing a good thing in, in, in terms of, and so he's just like David, nodding his head, yes, yes, and, you know, he seemed to understand. But in terms of, it seems to me a real challenge for, for a lot of the families that, that we're dealing with, at least in my world, is we're dealing with the next generation, is to get them to have that appreciation. And so, and so we, we, we encourage them to do their own thing and be their own person. But if they can take what the, the previous generations have built and, and take that and build it further, you know, for their own personal wealth, of course, but also to make, to make the world a better place. So if you can take what you're given and grow it. Like David's mother, he talked about, you know, that, 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 that farm. David's mother, I suspect, you know, not a lot of resources, but she would have been the kind of person to go outside and plant a flower, maybe. He's nodding his head. Okay, he agrees. But in terms of, if, if, if you can take what's given to you and plant a flower, grow a business, create a job or whatever, make the world a better place, and that's in terms of a, a core value that we can teach the next generation. And I think that's so very, so very important. Uh, so, you know, just to summarize what we've been doing on the research side in, in family business, there's been a lot, of, a lot of things happening. So I started in family business by researching entrepreneurs. And I, I, I ha asked Claire to pass out something about Bill McGregor. I'll talk about him uh, a little later in terms of you know, one of the pioneers of the oil industry, one of the key entrepreneurs in Alberta, you know, the Leduc number one and all that sort of story. I've had the privilege of going around interviewing those sorts of people and in terms of what, what have they done and how, how did they become successful. And, and uh, guess what? They started one way, but it, Excuse me, many of them ended up with family firms, and I'll, I'll make the point in a second. But in terms of, you know, in terms of research, what, you know, most of my research with early entrepreneurs was that many of them had family concerns. And about, about 15 years ago, we started a project uh, you know, with, with some generous sponsorship from a number of donors. And uh, we set out to sort of study family business a little more. And what I found, I was in Europe, and, and uh, I was sitting at a family business network conference. A consultant comes in and says, you know, generation, generation, trust leaves, trust leaves in three generations, you know, and, and you know, listen to me, you're gonna go to hell in a handbasket, your family's gonna be destroyed and so on. But I'm looking around the room, not uh, unlike this room, and I'm seeing a bunch of successful people. And I'm thinking, what, what's going on here? Like in terms of this, there's sort of a disconnect in terms of the message, and we know that in terms of this, there's some communication, conflict, succession are key things, but there's, but a lot of family firms are getting it right. And yet at universities, we really weren't talking about family firms a whole lot. And uh, myself being an organiza organizational theorist, and some of you have seen me do this before, uh, I'd say if this, is the pot, if this sheet was to represent the population of firms in the world, most of them are family firms. That what, that's what we, we know in terms of we can read that in a lot of places. Most of the world's firms are family firms. Yet at the universities, it seems to me, we were just studying a very small percentage of firms. So you could get a BCom or an MBA and you'd study these firms and never hear the word family firms. And that's all changed. We're, we're, you know, many schools, we've got some good programs at the U of A, many schools are, are focusing on these firms and trying to understand how family firms work. And there's some you know, key topics, and we do a lot of you know, research conferences and so on, but one of the things in terms of, the, if I can summarize some of the big topics, was that uh, the uh, first was this whole notion of, of uh, that family firms powerfully exist throughout the world. That's one key thing. I think in the research programs we've done is we're, we're, that people are simply noticing family firms. And there are certain dimensions to family firms that, that, that family firms is a good way to organize enterprise in terms of it's, they're efficient. They do things. They can pass on things in terms of roles and routines and so on. And, and that, that's an Anglo-American sort of forms of capitalism. But particularly when you go elsewhere in the world, we go to developing countries and so on, uh, when they don't have the institutions of capitalism, like good stock markets, legal systems, property rights, and so on, families, if you can get an enlightened establishment, of families, that's still the best way of going in terms of from an economic development perspective, Africa or where have you. So we're, we're getting a, a great appreciation for that. And uh, so, but there, and then there's other notions and so, so some of the research has been saying, you know, the family firms outperform non-family firms. So you get some sort of measure of whatever a family firm is, and then you say, do they perform or not perform? And then there's been another notion uh, called social emotional wealth. And these, essentially, these, the, I know the researchers, but they were researching all of mills in Spain. And in all of Mills, they had this opportunity to uh, uh, join a cooperative. And they could clearly make more money if they joined a cooperative. But they, but they said, no, we don't want to join a cooperative because we value our autonomy and freedom and so on. And the finance guys are scratching their head. What? Isn't business all about profit? And these, yet these families were saying no to profit because they valued they had other values. 
And, and this is social emotional wealth is this big new concept that people are talking about family business. And for those researchers, I keep thinking, they should have researched and come and visited a farm in Saskatchewan or some of the people in the foothills that are trying to preserve other things. It's not just about the money. But then that puts into a whole nother, so but that puts into a whole nother dimension, like what is it in terms of the family firms? They, they provide uh, wealth clearly to a lot of people. But there's something else about uh, family firms, working together as families and growing and so on, that, that, that's not measurable. And, and that's an important component. We're trying to understand more of that. And so some of the more recent things we're talking about, working on an article now on heterogeneity in family firms is sort of a new topic we introduced, that came about a couple of years ago. In terms of that family firms are different. They're so, so unique. They're not like, if you look at a publicly traded firm, they kind of have to follow certain rules and sort of the same. Family firms are just infinite in variety in terms of, and we're trying to understand that variety a lot more and, and, uh, and we're talking about configurations of strategy and structure, have these goals. What, and so those are some of the, the topics we're working on right now. But that also makes me acutely aware when I'm talking about family firms, an audience such as this, so, you know, in terms of they're, they're different in terms of size, life cycles, age, and so on. So what, what their conclusion could be is that one size doesn't fit all in terms of governance. So it's important to sort of share and so on and so forth. But you have to understand, you have to first understand your firm before you can come up with some sort of recipe for how you're going to deal with whatever issues that you might have, because there, there is this infinite variety. So forums such as this are, are really good in terms of learning and sharing, and, but, but, but there's, no, there's no magic bullet in terms of that works or formula that works for every family. I just really want to make it known you each family has to discover in their own way, take their own journey in terms of what works. And I'll make a, a point a little later about, about governance. I'm going to start with four stories, and then I'll come back to the story. So my stories are about a dog, a Shetland pony, a day at the lake, and running big boats. So the dog story. This is a true story. It's a family gathering at a lake cottage. And there's about 50 people up on the deck. And there's, uh, down on the beach, there's a, you know, there's a mother with two small ch children, toddlers, and a dog. And she's sitting on a little chair. And the kids are playing with sand pills on, on the beach. And everybody else is up on the, on the deck. You know, families, in-laws, outlaws, and so on. And there's some water skiers at, at, the, uh, at the lake. And one of the things with water skiing, if you have water skiing, some pe people like to come in close to shore and just to drop up, to, to stop when you stop, you come in real close to shore and you sort of whiplash in. And this particular boat got too close to shore and the skier, big bulky guy, whiplashes in, going way too fast, hits the shallow water and falls off his skis, but he's still running. You know, this big bulky guy's running straight towards the mother, two children, and the dog. And everybody's watching, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? The mother grabs the dog and runs. <laughs> so I've asked this story before with the dog or the children. And some people say, oh, I want to like the dog and so on. So, of course, <laughs> everybody saw this. Nobody's ever forgotten <laughs> what she did that day. So it seems to me life is a series of choices. Where am I going with this in terms of we all? <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Kids are fine, mother's fine, and I've been telling the story for many, many years. But, we, 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 but life is about decisions sometimes, we make, we make decisions. So I said, where am I going with this? Sometimes we all make decisions. Sometimes we have more time to make them, sometimes for the moment. The kids, the business. The kids, the business. And sometimes when we're growing businesses, we sometimes forget the kids and so on. Now, if anyone ever tells me it's, all, you know, it, it's, it's the business first, or you know, we, we, we wouldn't advocate that, but if, if someone says to me, it's all, I always put family first and business second, you're also not telling the truth. You know, you're just not being honest with yourself. In terms of, so we, we have to make these series of decisions all the time. If we choose the dog too many times, the, <laughs> the family won't be happy. <laughs> and sometimes when it comes back to haunt you a little bit later. So the, uh, the next uh, uh, story is about Numac Oil and Gas. And Bill McGregor was one of, the, you know, one of the key entrepreneurs in terms of development of Western Canada. And I had the privilege of, of uh, 
interviewing Bill McGregor and many, many, many others. And I like to use Bill because I picked Bill because it's close to Calgary, it's oil and gas families, next generation, and so on. And when I interviewed, I interviewed Bill, tape recorded what he said, and so on. Wonderful man. He's now deceased. And just, just lo you know, love the guy. And I've often used this, his example when I'm teaching entrepreneurship classes in terms of what, you know, what can we learn from these larger-than-life entrepreneurs. And there are many of them, not just in oil and gas, but, but these are people who built Alberta, who built Western Canada, and we need to celebrate and appreciate what they've done. But when I talk to Bill and say, you know, Bill, tell me your story, and, and uh, <laughs> David has already told the story, you know, but here's, here's notes from my interview with Bill in terms of, you know, founding Moomba Carolina Gas. So you got sort of a general overview. He's in a, a, a Hall of Fame and all this stuff. But it says, uh, so I'm just going to, some quotes from my, from excerpts from my tape with Bill. Really, I haven't told you this story, but my sister and I used to ride five miles to school on a horse, and uh, we're we, we took a shortcut. One day I fell off the horse, and uh, it had, it, the saddle blanket fell off and so on. It was dark, well, short version of this, it broke my arm. But it was hard, it was muddy roads and so on, we couldn't get to Calgary to a doctor. So my, my, my arm uh, was locked in place because it was broken. So two months later they get to a doctor in Calgary after spring thaw and all this stuff. This doctor. <laughs> Okay. Well, I hurt my arm and we yelled for help. My dad put a sling around my neck. I stayed home for a month or two. When I took the sling off, it was like that, indicating that it's all you know, crooked. And so anyway, about me, one of the neighbors got the cars going. And I remember dad taking me into Calgary. We saw Dr. McKid there and he took a look. He said it was broken at the elbow. He said there are two things we can do. I can re-break it, or he said, he is young. Take a rock about that big and put it in a sugar sack and tie it to your wrist. He said that might just be the thing. So I was for all for that. that. That's what my dad did. So it, it, so it you know, tied a sugar sack with a rock to his arm. He says, so it pulled, out, it pulled it out by about summertime. It straightened out and we threw the rock away. I remember my dad saying to the doctor, how much is that? And the doctor said, no charge. So that's Bill's story. You know, I, mean, we, I could go on and on in terms of you know, what, 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 what Bill did. And it, he has these hardship stories, which, which are great. And then he goes on in terms of, you know, we found it. So, he, so he's got this ranch down by Turner Valley. And by working hard, and he also got other stories about working on a dairy farm that, at his father's farm. I used to milk the cows during the summer holidays. It was 365 days a year. You know, so you walk to school both ways, milk the cows 365 days. You know, this, this work ethic that we know so well and, and much appreciate. So uh, then uh, Bill builds, builds a ranch and sees with the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Act. He could dig some dugouts, spot a caterpillar, and he's making these roads and so on and so forth. And then he says, you know, I had it made. I'm still a very young man. And I've got a, a good farm he was able to buy from another rancher. It's another interesting part of his story. And uh, 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 I said, a brand new house for, for the wife and kids. A, a, a brand new house for the wife, a Shetland pony for the kids. And uh, then I saw up Leduc number one to do more cat work. Go up to Leduc, and then I could see, you know, I did some cat work. But then I could do other things. I could see we bought a little lease. You know, uh, by Kalmar, some other guys from Calgary, started drilling a hole, never smoked, went to a two-pack-a-day smoker, almost never got oil, but we found oil, you know, so the rest is we developed this, this big oil company. So I often use this story when I'm teaching entrepreneurship, and I say, you know, if you really want to be successful in business, you have to work hard, do all the things that Bill did, and sometimes you have to leave behind the new house in the Shetland Pony. How many of you are willing to do that, to be successful in business? And I preach that. I was an entrepreneurship professor. That, I, that's what I preached. And, and, and that's what Bill did. He said, so I talked to my wife. He said, we just go up to Edmonton for two years. Never moved back. Left the nice ranch, the new house, and God knows what a Shetland pony is. <laughs> but for this talk, I was reflecting on, the, on, this, on, on, on this whole entitlement thing. And I was thinking, you know, with, with, by, between the ages of about five and nine, you know what, the one thing I wanted most in the world? Come on, you guessed it. I wanted a Shetland pony. My parents said, but we live in town. So, well, I can put it in the back shed. But, you know, in terms of, you know, I sincerely wanted a Shetland pony for a long time. It matched my cowboy outfit, but anyway, it's an honest. So, so, 
sometimes in terms of building the business, the kids have a much bigger investment than we appreciate. And we celebrate certain things, but the kids have made a big investment in this as well. Uh, no, so back to your choices, the dog, the kids. Third story, at the lake. About 20 years ago, we're at, we're at our lake cottage an hour from Edmonton. And there's this nice family, and they're visiting us, and they've got three kids, and, we're, and we had a dinner on Sunday, and we leave, kids are outside playing, the kids come in and say, uh, can, we, we just, can we stay here tonight at Steyer's place? They got, you know, play. And we said, you're welcome. Well, what, you, what else are you going to say? You're welcome to stay, and so on and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the parents. And the father didn't know. They had a small manufacturing company. And so the kids went out and played again, and we sat there for a good hour, hour and a half, with, with this, his spouse and him and my wife. You know, you're welcome to stay, and so on and so forth. And, and you know, the kids are having a good time. It's a long summer evening. And he's, he's struggling. He doesn't know what to do. And he says, well, I've got this company. Yes, I've got good people in the morning. I don't have to show up at 8 o'clock, but, you know, I can come at 10 o'clock. We'll, well, you, you know, we'll get you up early, get you out the door. You can still get to the office. He's, and, and, you know, people will cover for you. He says, that, that's not the point. He says, you know, I've got these workers. I don't want to be, you know, con conveying these values that, you know, the boss just comes in at any sort of time. So, and the wife is really twisting his arm, stay, stay. And, and, uh, and you know, so we, we sat for well over an hour, and he's agonizing over what to do. And he said, no, we're going to town. So they went to town. Yeah, okay, business over the family, that's fine. Uh, so uh, what's the end of that story? Did the kids come back and say, Dad, you never let us stay at the lake? We, we made all these compromises. Actually, today, two sons are involved with the father in the business, and, and, and the daughter is involved with the mother in the business. So there's 20 years later, they've got this nice little family business, but in terms of where that, you know, what I'm saying is, you know, you, if you could be choosing the business, it's not necessarily the wrong thing to do. So, but then finally we want to have these experiences. So we have, we, we have things like what Bill McGregor was saying, uh, you know, walked uphill both ways and kids, you know, kids, you know, we, we sort of, we, we, like when I'm talking about, you know, 10 generations of dealing with wealth or, or first generation wealth, Guys like Bill McGregor, guy, I, I've met hundreds of these people in Alberta. They don't know how to work hard, they don't know how to do this and that, they want to communicate those values. But they don't know how to raise kids with wealth because they didn't do it themselves. So, uh, in, uh, uh, to, to a further story along those lines, is I'll, I'll share David Martin, uh, son of Prime Minister Paul Martin, and it's public because they spoke at a, uh, Alberta Be Business Families Institute uh, dinner here and at Edmonton, and David shared his story. And I know, I know David personally from other board matters, but, but I wouldn't share this story unless it was a, in the public domain. But, so when David Martin, his dad had Canadian steamship lines, when David Martin turned 16, dad said, well, I think, you know, I used to work on river boats and all this stuff, you know, I want to make you a man, you got to get out there and work on, on our Canadian steamship lines. So David gets out on a boat in the middle of the ocean, he's got this job painting rails and so on and so forth, and there was a bit of a, I'm going to call it a union, but there was a bit of a labor dispute with management. And according to David, you have no idea what it's like to be the boss's son or the owner's son on this boat in the middle of the ocean when people are really upset with management. It wasn't easy. Uh, and sometimes we, 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 we try and replicate, you know, dad's just doing a good thing, work hard like I did. We try and replicate these things and, and we, don't, we don't always, we're not always successful. Uh, and, and, and David later related stories when he took over when his dad was prime minister of the, of the firm itself. And so w w the issue is being in terms of when, when you're, again, an, an owner, do you, uh, w uh, and, and you already got good senior management in place, what's the relationship between you and senior managers? And sometimes the next generation f feels they have to manage the same way as their father did. In that case, you don't have to be a manager. You, you can outsource management if you have a large firm. But you can't outsource governance. That's, you know, family type responsibility. But sometimes the next generation has trouble, they, they're trying to imitate or, or emulate what, the, what their parents did, and, and it's a com completely different situation. So we need to, but, but we don't know any better. I, you know, myself as a parent, I, you know, I, I tr give, try and give kids, my kids values that, that I might have had or, or been raised with and, and, and work ethics and so on and so forth, but it's, but it's different for them. And we need to sort of somehow uh, forge something that, that sort of works within, within the context of this new environment. So, and we need to, we need to understand you know, the, the, the next generation, some of the challenges that they have. So, I've, I've just given you some of the challenges of working with management and so on, but some of the other challenges would be uh, the, uh, 
when you're working with next generation, and, I, and, I've, and I've talked to some people knowing I was going to give this talk. I was just in, in, in France giving some talks, and I was working with people who, are, who do the next generation with the Family Business Network. And so you get, you get the next generation in the room and get them talking of some very substantial large. The, the collective theme when you get them talking in terms of what, what this person related to me, the number one theme that comes out when you get them in a room alone and build a trust, number one is guilt. You know, I don't deserve this, this wealth, and friends are pointing it out to them, and so on and so forth. And, and, and that's a, a, a tough thing to, to grow up with. Uh, other people, when I was talking at a conference last week in, in Edmonton, Family Business Alliance people, people work a lot with Next Generation, they say, well, you know, we really admire Next Generation in terms of what they're doing. And what, what I'm seeing in terms of my work, and we did, did some work with the Young Presidents Organization in Western Canada, and so I said, I'll work with you, but I want to talk to all the second generation people in YPO, and YPO, you know, pretty substantial firms. So I went to Calgary and Saskatoon and Edmonton talking to, to, uh, to next generation YPOers. These are people who essentially had inherited something from their families, whether it's uh, the business or so, something else, but they were, they were next generation. And I was, uh, it was remarkable what these people were doing. Because, you know, you, the, number one, they're, they're running a complex firm. They're doing, they're, they're, first they're feeling a little inadequate because they're hearing all these stories about their father. And we just take a little side trip here. Sam Johnson, Messi Johnson, the Wax family, I met him a couple of times at these family business events. He talks about growing the firm 40 times over, but still feeling guilty because his father would be picking on him and, uh, and saying you're not doing enough and so on and so forth. So does that sort of angst of, of dealing with, with, with the existing management that we referred to before. So what I, what I say when I was giving a presentation to YPO is what I discovered in terms of the themes, what they're talking about is the next generation has, a, has the real issue of what I'm going to call managing down, managing organizations. But they also inherit something else, not just managing down. They have to manage sideways, what I'm going to call managing sideways. There's a whole group of family members there in terms of shareholders and some who think they were robbed when they weren't robbed and some who were robbed and weren't, you know, whatever it might, might, might be the case. But that whole family dynamic is something that they're, that they're managing that their previous generation never managed at all. And then there's that whole issue of what I'm going to call managing up, managing with, with, with dad or mom. And, and, and that's very complex as well. So these, so these people are, are, are stuck managing always. They're doing something much, much more complex than, than, their, than their parents ever did. And, and, and they're sometimes un unappreciated for it. And every day they're told, you know, I went to school, uphill both ways, so sorts of stories. And, and, they're, and they're having to do, you know, all, all of these other things. And the other thing that, that, that they really struggle with is succession. And they're not getting good advice on succession. And succession, that we, we treat succession and we, in North America, which is, is if we just pass it on and, and mom and dad are supposed to go golfing or off to Palm Springs and just stay there. Don't bother us. It, but it's not, when you, if you really look at succession, the people who good family firms, there's something there, there's a lot of wisdom in next generation. And, and, and it's about letting go, it's about change. And we're, right now we're dealing with a situation where mother's been told she should go to a home and all that she understands mentally, uh, intellectually what she should be doing. Excuse me. But it's change, giving up treasures and all those other sorts of things, and the pictures and tablecloths and all those sorts of things. It's about, it's about change. And, you, and, and what we know about building a business, and I've said earlier, you do not build a successful business without passion. And if you've got passion for something, it's darn hard to let go. So in this, the whole sort of succession thing, in terms of it seems to me, in, in, in some cases, it's good. Make the clean cut and go. But it's kind of like, but, but what I see more, what I see, for example, in farm families, it's a 10 or 20 year process. And when I've interviewed some of these people, it's, it's uh, I'm not sure when it took over. You know, dad is sort of this and this and this and became less involved, but still would come out at harvest and so on and so forth. So it's, a, sort, of, it's sort of a 10 or 20 year negotiated process. And, and, and I'm just finished being on a PhD committee for a fellow who was doing uh, out of, uh, uh, saw it, uh, out of uh, Simon Fraser in, in, in Vancouver University in succession in Turkey. But, uh, you know, how fathers never, you know, until they die sort of thing. But, but that's not unusual. And so we have to sort of negotiate this whole thing about succession and work together. And those are some of the challenges that we would have in family business. Now, uh, you know, I started the, 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 uh, the talk with in terms of, uh, you know, this entitlement thing and all, all firms are different. But one of the, one, one of the mistakes that we make we really underestimate how important governance is in terms of how we structure family. And I, and I made the point that all, all families are different and we're all challenged to, to, to come up with our own sort of unique governance structure. Uh, but 
all, you, but you can't just have what, what, a key point, I think it's in one of the titles that I was talking to Claire, you can't just put a government system together uh, based on, on love alone. You know, all, you know the, the Beatles had it wrong, all you need is love. There's, there's something more than that in terms of, and good governance goes a long way. And so we, we create these structures where we, when we, we, we run into challenges where people do not have the governance system in place. And, and I think of when I see these family firms, and I think in my own life, we have a share, uh, one twelfth share of a condo in, in Canmore, and I have a quarter share in an airplane, and we basically get along. And why do we get along? Because there's rules of behavior. And then I see these families who love one another squabbling over no toilet paper left at the cabin or whatever it might be, uh, and, and, how, and how that asset is used. And so uh, governance at a very simple level, and we, and we have some seminars on that, you know, managing shared assets and so on. But uh, so it, 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 you, you know, all families are challenged to sort of construct a governance system that works for them in terms of rules and how you're going to, and you can't just do it at the dinner table. Now there are all kinds of resources in terms of uh, you know, CAFE has all kinds of programs, you know, we have programs at AFV at the University of Alberta and so on, in terms of what it, it's, it's used to it's useful to have those cha changes or just professional advisors and so on. But it, you know, families need to take one step back and say, what, what are we doing here? And, 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 uh, and construct these systems. And we, we're also lucky too, in terms of what I'm saying, in terms of the, a, a real challenge that we have in, in, in Western Canada, is most of, most of our wealth, I'm gonna call it Bill McGregor wealth. You know, they sold Moomac oil and gas for $960 million. You know, Good thing you got that one arm working again. <laughs> uh, it's hard to count all that cash with this one. No. <laughs> but, but, but we have, we, we, those are a lot of stories. And in terms of when, when we go to some of those people, they say, well, it's simple. Just throw, you know, just the, if the kids only can appreciate that I worked hard and so on, there's something more than that. And, and I, you know, I don't know the particulars of the McGregor family and so on. But, you, you know, we, we really have, we're really challenged to help these next generations, because we don't have those old maps, and we're so, we're so, we're so lucky to have families that'll share, in terms of we're gonna have a speaker later, in terms of, we've heard the Richardson Hirsch family speak earlier, at some of the, uh, both in Calgary and Edmonton, that, that families will, will share their, their experience of, of six or seven generations, and how do they do that, you know, in terms of, or, or, or others in this room, there's a wonderful capacity to do, lo to do those sorts of things. So, uh, and what, 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 what I see, see is so important in terms of, is, uh, is, is nurturing that next generation because a lot, a lot not, not just for the, the, the success of our families and our businesses, but the, the, success, the success of our, our, collect, our, of our, of our society depends on, on nurturing uh, you know, entre you know, entrepreneurship, uh, economic development from these groups. So I often say working in entrepreneurship, there's a lot of resources going like business plans and getting people to start new firms and that's very important, but that's just one pillar of economic development. On the family business side, I see the same people, entrepreneurial, taking that those seeds that the parents have grown and, and growing them further, taking the seed from that one flower and planting many flowers. And I see the next generation of family businesses being able to do that. And I, I really want to encourage that. Or what some of the, the business people are in, in terms of helping family firms. You see, these, to me, a firm that even hires sweet people is a little miracle. I just, I know what it takes to start a business. And I see these firms that have 40, 50, 60 employees and they fail because they didn't get one. They, they, it's like being in, I always say, being in London, you look left instead of, look right instead of left and get hit by a bus. They're doing one thing wrong. And 50 people lose their jobs. 50 families are suffering. And it's, 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 an, it's, it's a, it's an awesome responsibility that we have in terms of working with family firms. So, uh, in the interest of time, um, you know, I'll, I'm just going to wrap that up. And just some some of the sort of key points. I think I think there's so much riding on the next generation. We should celebrate the next generation and give them give them the tools to carry to carry on. So, thank you.